let's talk about the Ghana Empire and beginning around the 5th century, around the 5th century, which would be the 400s. Thanks to the camel being available now and having the camel, Berber-speaking people were able to cross the Sahara Desert and go into West Africa. Before the camel, they made it sometimes, sometimes they didn't. Horses, donkeys, mules just obviously aren't as dependable in crossing the Sahara Desert, which is the largest desert in the world. Again, the Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world. And these Berbers who live in North Africa, they are crossing into West Africa. So the first question you want to ask is, well, you know, if you're going to cross the world's largest desert, you probably have to have a pretty good, pretty good reason why you want to go. Uh, I would connect this to, I mean, this still happens to this day and happens quite a bit. There are lots of people who cross the desert from northern Mexico, Arizona, into the United States. Probably people crossing it right now. Why do people do that? Better life, better job, money, not much different. Um, so they cross because they want a better life. So these traders, if they're going to cross this desert all the way over here with their camel caravans, they're doing it because they want the gold that's located in West Africa. And as your book said, how much of the world's supply of gold is located in West Africa at this time? Two-thirds. So 66% of the world's gold supply is located in West Africa. So there becomes traffic in here, and we get the launch of a new trade route. This trade route is called the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. And it's the North African Muslims, the Berbers are one group, for example, who cross back and forth, and they come here to get gold. The gold that they get, a lot of it is turned into coins. A lot of it is turned into coins. And much of this gold is used as coins and is traded along what we would call the Afro-Eurasian trade network. It's traded along what would be called the Afro-Eurasian trade network. The Afro-Eurasian trade network is basically the very large trade network that has the Trans-Saharan, the Silk Road, and the Indian Ocean trade route. How much of the world is on this Afro-Eurasian trade network? If you just look at a map, it's going all the way. It's going to have to go all the way from West Africa, across the Sahara, across North Africa, into the Silk Road, all the way to this region of Asia, because this region they're trading by ship. So a huge chunk of the world is on this trade network, and the coins that come from Africa are found all over this trade network. So it's basically, it becomes the currency or the money. It becomes the money that you use to trade. So when people are trading for silk, there's a good chance they're using coins that are from West Africa. And that becomes extremely valuable at this time. The people who become powerful, they're known as the Ghana Empire, but it's actually the Sonike people. They call themselves the Sonike, but the Arabs, they are the North African Berbers who come in, my mistake, the North African Berbers who come in, they start calling them the Ghana because their king is called Ghana. So the Sonike people, they slowly build, at first it's kind of like a confederation of loose states, but it becomes an empire. They build this empire because they realize with their gold, 
They have a valuable asset. They have a <clears throat> valuable you know, commodity, something that they can trade, and they want to protect it. So yeah, they're watching their assets. <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> so they're protecting them. So they basically build a border around where all the gold mines are. So the Sonic A build a border around where the gold mines are, and they are able to build a monopoly of gold for the gold. They're able to control all the gold trade. So the people come in. They have to deal with the Sonike people, who are also known as the Ghana. Okay? So we can call them Sonike or Ghana. They're the same people. This is actually true in um, uh, South America, too. Um, for students who are from Ecuador, um, for example, the people were not called the Inca. The Inca was the king of the Inca Empire. The people were called Quechua, which is actually the language, too. The people are called Quechua. The Inca was the name of the king, but the Spanish called them the Inca people. So the Sonique is very similar to that. So um, they have their gold. They build their empire. They're able to keep outside people, and they get stronger. Because trade typically makes you richer, and it's how many kingdoms are built. All right, so what do they trade, and what do they trade for? What gets traded? The biggest thing that gets traded for this gold is actually salt which is kind of surprising that salt is traded for gold. But salt is actually, and sometimes, worth as much as the gold. It is equal. And first thought might be, well, I would like to take my big thing of salt that costs a dollar and go get some gold. Um, salt wasn't as plentiful back then, and the people of West Africa didn't have access to salt. And gold's nice, it's shiny, it's a good metal, but you really don't have a practical use for it. Do you have a practical use for salt? It's a preservative, which means that it can preserve meat. It can preserve food. Also, it's a natural part of your diet. If it's really hot out, you need salt. It helps you with like sweat and all that stuff, I guess. So anyway, salt is, in a lot of ways, more valuable than gold. So Ghana becomes known as the land of gold, and they build their capital at Kumbi Salah. They build their capital at Kumbi Salah. I'm going to go back a little bit. The quote I showed you to start the class is now up on our blog, too, so if you want to go back, you can see the lecture video. The quote I, saw, I showed you was from al Bakri when he came to West Africa. And this was a description of what the royal court was like at the city of Kumbi Salah. So the quote, the quote you wrote down and the details you wrote, this was the court at Kumbi Salah. And the Ghana Empire is able to rise based on establishing the gold trade. And they're able to rise based on establishing the gold trade. And they get other materials coming in. So what was traded besides gold? Salt, obviously. And let's see here. Uh -oh. okay. Textiles, so clothes are brought in. Copper, other metals. Other finished goods and finished products. Silk is even brought in. We saw evidence of that coming from the Silk Road. So everything from the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean Trade Basin, they're now connected to that and they can have access to those goods to the North Africans that bring them in across the Trans-Saharan. One more thing that's traded, well, actually, people are traded too. There is slavery. And there is a slave trade. Now, the slave trade is different from the slave trade we're going to read about for our research paper, which is called the Atlantic Slave System. That's where Africans are brought to the Americas, are brought to Brazil, are brought to the United States. There is a slave trade, but it's different. This slave trade is um, uh, based, people who would become a slave would be oftentimes people who were in debt, people who were in prison. It could be people who were defeated in a battle. They could become slaves. Also in this slave trade, if you were a slave at this time, it didn't mean necessarily your kids would become slaves. It wasn't based on your skin color. 
It was just a different group of people that they were taking over. It wasn't like they were looked like this, they looked like this, those people are slaves. That will become a later part of the Atlantic slave system. Yes? Yeah, it was more like Rome. It was like in Rome, China, parts of Europe. Even some um, tribes in the Americas had slavery. So there was slavery all over the world at this time of many different groups of people. You could be light-colored skin and be a slave. You could be dark-colored skin and be a slave in the world at this time. It's important to remember that. Also, the slaves that were traded, uh, they would be more like servants for families. Sometimes slaves even married into their families in North Africa. That could happen. Um, some even were get, able to get jobs in the military. There's even stories of some slaves becoming like generals in the military in North Africa. Now, were they free? No, they weren't free. But it wasn't quite the slavery many of us think about when we think about the slavery that will come to the United States later on. So, this is the Empire of Ghana. They rise because they have the gold trade and they're able to basically monopolize it and take control of it. Uh-oh, what did I know anything else? All right, let's talk about Islam's influence and then the fall of Ghana. So, first, Islam's influence, as we know a little bit. Um, now, Ghana eventually becomes an Islamic empire, as we already talked about. And Islam spreads with trade in Ghana. We talked about this in the last chapter. As these Berbers, North Africans, come into Ghana, they bring in literacy, they bring in writing, they bring in Arabic, and many of these people who can read and write Arabic become really good at becoming advisors to the king. So much so that the king pretty much gets surrounded by Islam and Muslims. And then slowly the emperor converts to Islam. It's also kind of convenient because if he's the same religion as the people who are coming in and trading, it just makes things a little bit easier to do with the same religion. <laughs> so, the empire becomes Islamic. Now, shortly after this, and it's not because they became Islamic, but the empire does fall. It has a little bit of disagreement on how it fell. There's a tradition, and there's an Arab tradition, where it's written down that the Almoravids, I write that down here now, that the Almoravids came in and that they took over Ghana. So there is a tradition that says the Almoravids came in and that they took over Ghana. But some historians disagree with this. Some historians say that never actually happened. Another interpretation is that the Almoravid influence came in and they kind of slowly blended into the culture and that they didn't, but they never took it over. What we do know happened in the 10 hundreds, or 11th century, 12th century, the 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds, new gold fields were found. So there were new gold fields that were found and they were outside of the Ghana Empire. This would be in the um, uh, 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds, 11th century, 12th century. <laughs> So what happens is there's gold mines outside of the empire. So what Ghana is not able to control this. So other traders who come in are able to come in and buy their gold from other people outside the empire. And they can't come into Ghana. That hurts Ghana because what Ghana also did was they taxed all the gold trade. And that allowed them also to get a lot more money. So Ghana taxed the gold trade, which allowed them to get a lot more money. When other groups of people on the outside of the empire start selling to the North Africans, Ghana starts to lose power. As other people come and they start to move on the outside of the empire, Ghana starts to